being able to hear voice of ancestors, it's being able to hear your intuition and relying and trusting in it, which I am, you know, um, trying to bring to this Western culture. There are certain English words such as attention, intuition, observation, uh, that actually has very shamanic, very deep meaning behind that. And taking for granted those words, it weakens our own skills. Stay tuned, stay curious. And Culturation Podcast. Snow Raven, thank you so much for coming on the show. I can't believe, literally can't believe that you're here. I first discovered you in 2020. Um, so it's like sometime in the middle of pandemic. I, I forgot because that whole year is, is a blur because of all the things that happened. But I first discovered you through uh, watching your cover of Bjork, Human Behavior. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, my partner and I at the time were, uh, or she was introducing to me a lot of throat singing. And then I forgot how I found you, but somehow, you know, the YouTube algorithms or the wormhole crawling, right? Yeah, I f- found that song and I was like blown away. Blown away because Bjork is not someone that someone can just casually cover. She is very, very, very creative, artistic. And so it takes a certain um, level of creativity and originality to even attempt to cover Bjork, right? So the fact that you covered her in such a unique and interesting manner, I was like, you know, just blown away. I couldn't, I couldn't really process what was happening. And I, sh- I, I shared that video to all my friends and I was like, one day I'm going inter- to inter- interview her. Oh, wow. <laughs> First of all, here you are. Is it real? <laughs> I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we believe this is real. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, you meant to be this way, you know, um, uh, during this uh, winter solstice ceremonies here in San Francisco. And, you know, just uh, by a sacred orchestration of the universe, um, sitting here and I'm ready to share, you know, uh, knowledge and wisdom of my people and share my own story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm so so happy that uh, this is happening. Thank you once again. So I I uh, saw in another interview that your name Snow Raven you got from a shaman, and initially you were shy away from accepting that name or embracing that name. But you know, somewhere between the lines, four years later, you welcomed it. Could you walk me through that whole process? Yeah, the. Uh Name Snow Raven came from a shaman woman back in my homeland. And uh, she she looked at me and she said, Oh, you are Swar. And Swar means raven. And uh, Swar usually associates with, uh, you know, very heavy energy. It's a rebirth and death. Um, it has a, such a, you know, deep spiritual meaning. And quite often s- s- uh, ravens, they... Um, they support and help uh, shamans. And I had a, such a body reaction, like, oh, you know, this is not me. I'm, I'm too young to carry that name. And um, after four years of resistance, you know, usually what you resist persists. <laughs> the energy of raven kept coming. And all the memories, how I was so close to, to, to the ravens, um, back in my homeland, I remember, you know, cutting like raw meat, cooking, preparing for the cooking. And I would always give the best part of the meat to Raven first and put them outside near to the window so I can see them closer. And I always, wherever I go, Ravens, they're um, very well spread in the world. And it feels like they welcome me and they do all of the sound. And when I, you know, do this <coughs> raven sound, they answer back. So that's how I um, felt connected to my first autumn animal. And the name Snow, it, it represents um, raven surviving minus 96 where our winters are really, really cold. So raven can stay there. They don't migrate. They stay there. And uh, so snow raven specifically represents swar, sacha, 
you know, the Arctic Siberian raven. And once I received my name, when, once I accepted it, I felt my wings, you know, uh, spread really wide and was ready to fly. So that's how the whole project Snow Raven was born. Well, amazing. Yeah, and speaking of, you know, growing up in 96 degree or negative 96 to be like, yeah, negative 96 degree weather. How did you process that? Because I know um, you mentioned that you were lucky enough to have electricity in your house. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's in your own words was viewed as a, uh, a luxury, right? So I think, um, help me understand what uh, either you or your culture views as luxuries or was actually a center, was actually necessary. Um, well, I was born during summer solstice, June 15th, almost around summer, sol summer solstice. And winter solstices, that's where the temperature can go to minus 96 Fahrenheit. And um, I just can't imagine how many winters my ancestors survived to become who I am today and sitting here and talking and representing my culture. So it's just uh, uh, mind-blowing how, you know, human being can um, go through this cold and long winters and we're about to experience that. Tomorrow is 21st, you know, we are about to experience the darkest nights, the long nights and short days. And then after that, we call uh, which means the days become longer by the little steps of baby mouse. Um, so it's the daylight uh, become a little bit longer by the steps of little mouse. And for, for us, it's a big, 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 um, uh, big time of the year for Saha people. And I was born in Arctic Siberia, the place called the Republic of Saha Yakutia. And um, right now, my mom and three young sisters are there. And it's just, uh, it feels so nice connected to them uh, through the uh, my childhood memories. I know that right now they're experiencing severe cold. And imagine living in, in that environment without electricity. And... Uh, I call it luxurious style, uh, lifestyle because once you have electricity, it becomes more comfortable. My grandfather, who brought actually electricity to the village where I was born, he lived in a very traditional way uh, in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, they didn't have a heating system, no like water running through sink, no electricity. The only source of the heating was the fireplace and the cattle, which were, they were living together with people through the wall. And in a cold winters, they would open up the, the, the door of the, of the wall. So the animal heat would enter the human space. And I, c I can imagine, wow, they were breathing this ammonium, right? You know, all the smell. And it's just a lot of very um, survival, very raw and following cycle of life. And, uh, and uh, there were a lot of um, natural selection of life. So the, the time and place where I was born, it was truly luxurious, but still... We don't have uh, water running from sink in my grandfather's uh, house. We still, you know, uh, melt snow and ice cubes to drink water. And um, we still um, have a fireplace. We have to chop woods. Um, so it's, um, yeah, we don't have a shower inside of the house uh, or toilet inside of the house. Yeah, that's why I say electricity and um you know, um, the time where I was born after Soviet Union collapse, that was for me a luxurious lifestyle. And, it, you know, after Soviet Union collapsed, everybody became poor. But I've never experienced that. All the food supply was coming from grandfather taking care of cattle. The amount of love were put in the cattle was coming back to us as a, the purest, the, the, the most organic and healthy food and i've never experienced hunger so that's why i call it a luxurious lifestyle <laughs> so 
Yeah, I actually looked up the the village you. So I can't pronounce it, but it says U.S. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So that that place, right? I actually looked it on the map. We uh, you know, in preparation for this place. I don't know if it's because it's part of Russia, so Russia is like blocking um, the satellite imagery. But from from the um, the blurry ortho mosaic I got from Google Google Maps, uh-huh. it seemed like very very remote. So like, how how did you go from such a remote cold place to being so um, well versed in like so many talents, right? One, you're a singer, you're a producer. I saw you DJ over the other day, and also you're, you speak multi languages. So, like, what what was the like? F- help me fill in the gaps there. Yeah, <laughs> well, I really appreciate the way you look at the map, and you know, it's it's hard to find sometimes. You know, because it puts some Latin uh, letters in it, it was hard to find first time. Uh, for for myself, <laughs> you know, and then um, it truly, um, if you look at it in the map, it, it's like in the middle of nowhere and we don't have roads. Every spring in May, when water season comes, we don't, ha- literally, we don't have a roads. We get um, isolated from Yakutsk, which is the capital. And that's why people have to uh, uh, store their food in advance. And that also made my place very you know, special there is no much there's no pollution there are no no much car and there are no much uh footprints and um so i was born there and i went to school so it has as a part of russian system um so it has a school kindergarten hospital and by the way, that was built uh, with by the community, which was led by my grandfather. He also uh, built um, the place of gathering where people can sing and dance together. Would it be fair or uh, accurate to call? Because uh, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the vibe that your grandfather was uh, the role of a village chief. Is that is that fair to? Calm as, as such. Yeah, he was the activist and one of the yeah, leaders, very strong leaders. And you know, during the communism, people were really driven by creating community, and everyone, everybody was even and equal. And um, the chief, uh, let's say, the chief of the village, the leader of the village, it's um, mostly person who represents. Um, people in a, in a bigger system, they just uh, go to, you know, um, represent um, people's voice in in so during Soviet Union time. And it was very interesting. Some of the cow milk, um, the people who milk the cows, they could represent small tribe and go even to Moscow. So it was a Soviet Union had a very interesting uh, structure where people from small remote places could go to bigger cities. And uh, my grandfather, one of as a one of the activists, he really left a deep footprint um, in the, in the history of our village. And he was a truly uh, he had a, like a such a phenomenon memory. He knew all the uh, family trees of each person in the village. He was a great storyteller and engineer and um, just um, such a good-hearted person and my uh, the provider of masculine energy in my life because I grew up without father and he was my father. And if, uh, growing up, um, taking care of my uh, mother and grandfather, it was just a great feeling because, you know, parents are still figuring out their life. They're still young and grandparents, their wisdom and their love, it's something very significant. And I think that gap should be fulfilled between, you know, uh, kids and their gra- grandparents, the grand kids and grandparents. Uh, so I... Um, I went to school it's called Kurbah Orto Skolata, which means. Um, was that a local school, or did you have to travel far? From it's it? it's a local school. It was literally like ten minutes of walk 
uh, during winter time, it's five minutes because you have to walk faster. <laughs> did, 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 <laughs> did you walk really by yourself cold. to school? Or did you? Oh, yes. Okay. At the beginning, no. At the beginning, from uh, first year to second, third, mother or grandfather, you know, was taking me to school. But, um, you know, first year, my mother was actually like sitting with me and um, helping me to focus on, on, on my um, education and even, you know, making my calligraphy really well. She, she was really a good mother uh, in terms of, you know, when you're young, your attention is all over. And for me, it's very critical uh, when at that age, parents should uh, be with children to navigate them and direct them. And that happened to me. So the rest of the years, 10 years, um, and in total 11, I, uh, you know, spent my time in, at the village being um, the best student and um, which I... I graduated with golden medal and in Russia it means like a a like a, the highest score and with that um I entered to uh university Northern Eastern Federal University and uh faculty of finance and economy and I have a master's degree on world economy um that's how I learned English but I l learned Russian Sakha Saha is uh, my native tongue, right? So we, we've been speaking and also speaking in school with teachers, but our books were all written in Russian. So it was second language. And then the third language was French, which is very strange, right? <laughs> in indigenous culture, we have French language. And my final exams were in the math, French and Russian. That's how I got high score and uh, entered uh, World Academy. So... And I was absolutely zero in English. Uh, and, and moreover, I had a strange French accent um, about myself, <laughs> about myself, about myself. All of my classmates at the university, they were like advanced English speakers. Did, did you watch a lot of French movies or, or how did you get the accent? No, uh, it's just there are very interesting um similarity between French and Sakha language. We have a lot of uh, vowels and consonants that are similar. For example, U, E, R, H, N, W, W, diphthongs. So the pronunciation um, uh, was pretty easy to take in. And I had a great teachers, uh, teachers who had a Soviet Union education in Sakha, Russian, French, and math those four subjects, that's where I was really active for. And, and I was also going to competition. And then I won, I won a contest in math and French language and Russian language. And I was writing also a um, scientific work on how to keep Sakha language clear. And I came up with an amazing... Um, like a clear, clear do you mean how to preserve language? Is that what you mean? Yeah without mixing it with Russian language, which we're experiencing now among young people. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to my teachers, really, really grateful, and to my mother and grandfather. Is there a written form of the Saka language or is it all oral? No, it's before it was oral, before Russians discovered us in 17th century. And then we had actually, uh, first alphabet was uh, written in Latin, and then it became Cyrillic. That's, that's, that's like super confusing. It is, right? <laughs> it is. And uh, there's something about oral, you know, when you are able to keep amount of information orally, you, A, you have a really uh, powerful memory. Um, and then B, you have a skill to improvise, which is connection to the source. For me, it's a direct connection to the source. So those skills, we are losing those skills today because today we uh, rely on devices, you know. And then since we started to memorize things by written, like basically relying on piece of paper, you know, that archives the knowledge. So we sometimes, we, we go back to see it. But it, when it was oral, it was just uh, something that you have to remember and at the same time, you merge with environment. It's, um, 
something that you have to retrieve right now, you know, from the source. As with oral, there's also a, a practice and an um, interaction we involve, right? So someone's speaking exactly. it, someone's hearing it, and then you recite it. And so there's like mm -hmm. a, a practice there. Exactly. That's why I, I think Saha culture, um, and then perhaps you heard it on the internet as a Yakut. So this is the second name that was given by Russians. But we call ourselves as a Saha people. So the Saha culture survived a, a lot of waves and impact and influence because so, of... I'm curious, uh, since you are so, so versed in different languages, including communicating with animals, um, as far as I can tell, and different animals at that, what what language do you dream in? I tend to notice, like, uh, when I dream, I still dream in English because English is now my pr yeah. pr uh, primary language, right? And uh, even when I speak Vietnamese to my mom, for example, my mind becomes like a... Mm -hmm middle school person because I don't I, my vocabulary is, isn't very advanced so like you know since you know so many languages what languages do you dream or or imagine in it's Saha it's still Saha which I'm really happy about because I was afraid oh my goodness I don't practice Saha every day I practice I speak only when I talk to my mother and sisters which is quite often by the way and um, I uh, listen to um, sort of podcasts and recordings in Saha. And there's heroic epic Olonjo. And I listen to songs in Saha. And of course, I sing in Saha, right? Uh, but sometimes in my dreams, I can, I, I, there were some moments uh, where I was speaking in, in English. And I remember one of them was uh, three years ago, I gave... A berry beverage from berry, Oton, it's a Saha one. Uh, and I gave it to Barack Obama. And I said, Would you like would you like to drink a special Saha beverage? <laughs> I remember like saying it in my dream. And it was about the time when I was like learning English, absorbing it. And it went into my bones, like into my <laughs> my brain <laughs> and I started to, 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 to speak in English but yeah primary, primarily it's Saha but when I'm in this uh, reality I, um, I'm i aware that uh, I think in English mm -hmm. very very interesting do, do you feel like when you think in different languages it, it changes how you see situations oh you know, there's something about the very good question. When you switch from one language to another, you actually um, live in the, that different reality. You embody the whole mentality and culture behind that. So, because I speak fluently in Saha and Russian, and hopefully English, <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, so, it's just something about, you know, even your voice tone changes and your just gestures, your facial expression, even the entire body expression, um, and the speed slows down or fast is fasten up. So I just um, noticed that in me. It's truly very, very um, altering when you shift from one to another language. Yeah, so I got to experience that from a second hand because my, my previous partner, she spoke eight languages. What? Yeah, and we were in a monogamous relationship together. But I feel like I was in a polyamory relationship because depending on what languages she spoke, she, <laughs> she would change, right? And I was like, wow, like that's I, I didn't know this could come out of a person. <laughs> did she did she speak the languages that you've been speaking to? Like, so which so languages you've she, been speaking to? She speaks to um, Mandarin, Russian, Quechua, Spanish, English, Mongolian, a little bit Kazakh, and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm losing count, but basically, depending on what language she spoke. So, for example, when she spoke Mandarin, she was very, like, super extra confident, like almost arrogant, arrogant and cocky, right? I'm like, damn, you're really, you're really full of yourself right now, right? <laughs> right? But when, when she speaks uh, Spanish, she gets, she gets really like, sassy and fiery. I'm uh -huh. like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. But when, when she speaks English, it's, it's, it's very articulate, very intellectual, but like a lot more shy. So her personality literally changes. I want to meet your, your partner, <laughs> <laughs> former partner. Oh, yeah. wow. It's yeah, yeah, so it's very interesting. Uh -huh. um, so, how how did you go from um, attending university to exploring your creative uh, journey? My creative journey actually started when I was two years old. My grandmother taught me how to sing traditional songs in order to participate in Saha uh, shamanic summer solstices. We call it Hich, and Toyuk and Ohuhai, the circle dance and singing. 
and was a major activity uh, and ritual uh, during the summer solstice. And I remember being such a small kid and uh, singing and dancing with elders. That was a really beautiful moment in my life. So uh, since that time, I've never, ever stopped singing. And it was more like a, like a natural environment, you know, in my village. I was always singing, even being so active in my, in my school and in the city, in Yakutsk, while I was at the university, never stopped singing. And moreover, it was just giving me more energy, more boost, and just bring my wing uh, back, whatever I feel lost or low. Um, and also, I, that's how I earned money too, you know, singing at the events. And being that young, I became an entrepreneur pretty quickly. And... Um, when I moved to Moscow in 2015, I met my uh, music partner, uh, a former music partner, Andreas, and that's where I decided to be a professional singer and artist. But before that, it was just a, just a passion. Did you just say 2017 or 2015? 2015. Okay, that's 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 relatively recently for for <coughs> how for in my opinion how, how good you are. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm grateful for my grandmother. Because what I notice in a lot of artistry, whether it's dance or singing or um, other art forms, is a big part of being an artist is finding yourself and not um, not being a complete copy of whoever you learn from or whatever inspires you. So, like, how do you navigate like being authentic to where you come from while still fusing in all these um, new influences such as American culture for example you know yeah my breakthrough happened uh, when I was 20 when I met Save the 12th Sky Tungus shaman I had a uh, such a rare chance to meet him um, and um, you know playing drum in my culture without permission uh, oh I would say we don't play drum without permission of the spirits. So I brought my drum to him and I asked, could you please um, negotiate with spirits and and um, bring permission, like, may I drum in my life? Is it possible? Um, and bring your blessing. Um, can I receive your blessing? And then after the certain ritual, he told me, yes, they give you a green light. You can... Um, drum, make a sound, hold rhythm. And since that time, you know, I started just to improvise and drum was um, my best friend. Like I was sometimes like sleeping with a drum and like next to me putting it, it just became so live. And um, when you improvise and let yourself, whatever comes, like whatever flow and whatever voice of your ancestor, ancestors goes through you, and you sing their voice through your body, it's, it becomes you. It's not like a copy of copy. It's uh, something very um, special that sits in, inside of you and um, perhaps it was sleeping. And uh, yeah, so till these days, I'm just, you know, um, using that technique technique of improvisation as a first step like a first layer of to create song and then after that I um uh it might even come up with a, like a something primordial and then I translate it into human language and it's Saha language my first language and then I can put them some melodies I can put some you know put it into genre and I'm becoming a music producer so I put layers and layers on top of that. And these days I'm preparing very special pop songs, um, which is huge for me. And I started to sing in English, which is something that I would never imagine, you know, um, to sing in English because I never liked how I was singing in English and never liked my accent. But then all of a sudden, you know, the accent becomes your uniqueness. And, um, I believe that um, in order to deliver some important messages, uh, music could be an amazing, amazing tool because sound doesn't have obstacles. 
and uh, I I'm working on it. It became part of my mission. And uh, very, very soon I'm going to bring out um, an interesting project in English. <laughs> wow, I can't wait to hear it. I, I, I heard uh, two of your most recent songs, Web of Life and Fragrance. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's talk about those, those two songs. Like, Because um, I think Web of Life is part in, in English, right? And the other part is uh-huh. Sakha language? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Web of Life uh, was inspired um, by the lyrics of Chief Seattle. And uh, for me, it was big to create a melody and make it a song. I found uh, his quote, uh, one of the uh, popular quotes on the internet, and then I immediately, immediately had this um, the notion of, oh, this is kind of rite of passage for me because... I came to the United States and I want to uh, bring something to Native Americans and kind of merge, uh, bring their voice, their message into the song and web of life. It was just uh, something that came out even without, you know, like um, the melody wasn't planned. I just sang it one and it easily uh, also uh, was laying on, on uh, I was singing with Saha technique singing technique and all of a sudden english words were laying perfectly and creating groove with sacha technique and it became a very special song where the second verse as you noticed it's in sacha so i always had a, a vision where i would like to bring english and sacha words together to create a song and um Andreas, uh, he is an amazing music composer. So he did the whole, you know, throat singing and drumming behind that. And when when we've created that song, there was a huge. Remember here in California, we we went through the really really huge, um, devastating wildfires, and um, we went to um, south of Bay Area. And I used to live here in Bay Area in Marin County, and we went to this. Um, place where the area survived the wildfires but it was still very very you know like the 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 ash were was there and um we did a special ceremony and we did a video and that video became a music a video for web of life and um also um i just recently collaborated with um, an AI artist from France, and um, I came up with an idea to bring voices voices of s- room, women, indigenous women, from six continents, uh, from baby to elder, and um, I sang the song, and we put the AI uh, mimicking my singing, uh, just the visuals, right? Not a singing itself, but the the visuals. And it's one of my favorite. It's just uh, such a powerful message. The way the women were delivering message of Chief Seattle, indigenous women around the world, delivering that deep message to the world through that song. I felt really, really proud about that piece of art. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. I definitely know what you mean by the wildfires. I moved up here in 2020 and I still remember looking out at 11 in the morning, one of the mornings or one of the days. And then the street light was on because it was so dark, full, filled with smoke and ash. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is happening? Is it night or day? Remember, yeah, I remember that day. And um, I did um, I did also video. I've been doing a lot of content for social media. It was like a dark red. Um, and I went on top of the uh, hill and I sang a crying song. And I, quite often when I do content, I just empty myself. Whatever comes to me, I just sucked in, in whole the environmental situation and I just cried, like almost like a weeping song came out. Yeah, it's on my social media. I remember that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I felt uh, it, it was interesting listening to Web of Life. And I'm glad you put the captions in that inside because I... At first, I was like not sure it was in English, right? And then once once I read it, I was like, I then started hearing all the words. I'm like, well, uh-huh. this this is, it it re reprogrammed how I heard um, the vocals. 
And then, then I started hearing the words. I'm like, oh, wow. It's, and then once you switch to Saga language, even though I recognized I couldn't understand it anymore, it still felt like the same song. It still felt like one mm. rather, than, rather than like a disconnect. Because I think sometimes when um, when artists or singers swap languages, it feels very cut and paste, uh-huh. right? Like, hey, now I'm in you know, Spanish or Vietnamese and now I'm in English. And it feels like they're, they're not related at all. But in this instance, it felt like one the whole thing, even though one part I could understand, one part I couldn't. It was, it was, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, you were the second person who told, who told me, one of my friends from Yale, um, he said, at the beginning, I also couldn't understand your English. And it's very... Um, common because i'm uh, you know my english is, is is weird it's not so much your english it's like the the way that you were like it's probably a word for this but the, the way you were grooving. like grooving to the the vocals and like uh, maybe applying vibrato or certain certain, yeah. certain things where it's it's at first it sounds like a, like a melody that you're doing with your voice but then i realized that the, the melody itself was a word that was making a sentence i was like oh my, this is dope you know? yeah, yeah. It, it that technique called kalah by the way Hey, this yeah, one. Yeah, that one. So it adds like a, an extra syllables and it creates the syllables, syllable becomes a groove. And it's like a jebo, jebo. So it, it, it still has this groove, right? And then humankind has not woven the web of life, right? And then it it just adds uh this kind of um an extra groove and i call it the kalahakh it's like a uh natural beatboxing and my ancestors were doing it because it comes actually from horse riding from traveling from one spot to another it would take 2 3 days on horse because it's a vast area and what people would do uh they would des- describe in a form of poetry the, environments and landscapes and weave it into melody and tap with the rhythm of horse and that's where the kalahakh becomes almost like a percussion so if i understand you right there's there's people riding on these horses and they're singing along and then the the hooves of the horse is ad- adding a natural beat as they're riding is, is that right yep there's even special uh a singing technique called the getting even s- singing and dancing technique uh, Degereng, which has the fun, fun, foundation for uh, the rhythm, is horse rhythm, the galloping. You know, it's funny. Uh, when, when I used to learn tap dance, there was there was sometimes when we would make uh, certain rhythms, and it was mimicking a horse actually. Uh-huh. And then we were like, "Oh yeah, a horse is a horse, of course, of course." And you make a certain um, time signature with your feet while just saying it. <laughs> yeah, and then you can recognize. Sometimes you can hear it in. Those rhythms uh, in modern songs, I mean, all kind of genres, they came from somewhere. They were originated from somewhere. And it's quite often comes from the environment where people living it. And perhaps also plant medicine that where they were using, you know, their ceremonies uh, that, um, you know, naturally make them to tap with rhythm. And also, you know, if you look at the birds, or any animal that makes sound, uh, they have own rhythm. And I always think like, what is, well, how do they perceive the world? How do they hear frequencies and rhythms? Why they've chosen that particular rhythm? And what does it mean? You know, that curiosity um, also became part of my life uh, when I started to look at it from more like a scientific uh, state of point uh, before when I was you know three years old when I lived in my village surrounded by nature I never paid attention on you know a rhythm or something it was just like a feeling I wasn't processing it through my mind but it was like a listening to sound with my entire body and because I grew up in a the silence there was no highways no much car, just very few of them. I could hear the natural reverberation, like reverb, delay, and echoes of the sounds. And that's what I call, you know, uh, when you do like, it can echo. On. So it can 
bounce against the hill. And that's how you can actually um, recognize, like, do like a map in your hair, like a natural GPS. And I was thinking, wow, maybe our ancient ancestors were navigating themselves through that, you know, doing like, hey, sound, hey, hey, or hop, 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 means there are heels to get, like a closer from each other. If it does tun, 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 instead of tun, 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 tun. So it, it, it has the whole scientific part of it if you start observing. So That's what I meant now. <laughs> how I perceive what you're saying is um, like our conversation earlier about like swapping the senses. How I perceive what you're saying is like seeing with your ears. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Seeing with your ears or listening to with your entire body. Yeah. There's even, you know, uh, an inventions where the drummers, instead of listening to BPM through the ears, the headphones, they have uh, transducers, like a oh, backpack. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, and then the bass would give them metronome, the beat. Yeah, it actually makes sense to me because uh, even as babies, uh, to help a baby be calm or be at ease, you start patting um, it on the back. Mm -hmm. And that's like a form of drumming on your actual body. Yeah, and then this is what is, we're actually going back to ancient technologies. There are some inventions in sound healing um, I'm, um, you know, I experienced some chairs and beds and mattresses where you lay down and you have the whole transducers, you know, giving you this vibration of the certain decibels that you can program, um, and Hertz that you can, um, program. And it becomes, instead of listening through the headphones, you, you hear it with the entire body. And uh, it's something that reminded me, you know, at the big festivals when you stand in front of subs, <laughs> you got exposed to. But it's also, you know, um, I think it's very important to see what is the uh, science behind that, what, how, what amount of, you know, what is the dosage. You don't want to be exposed too much. And yeah, it's it's very interesting time we're living in and specifically being here in the United States. All of these technologies just opened up. And uh, we're, yeah, researching and experimenting. I'm, I'm uh, totally, you know, in, in, in that field and uh, also being uh, curious. Yeah, what you're saying reminds me of uh, those videos I've seen where you play a certain frequency uh, connected to a sandbox. And that sandbox uh, turns into certain patterns depending on what frequencies you play. So taking the sandbox out of it, but applying that to your body, it's like those frequencies are going to your body and you start to feel it. That's why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting. Yeah, cymatic, right? You perhaps uh, referring to the videos, I've, I've seen that on YouTube, where uh, certain frequencies arrange uh, and it turns into a pattern and a really beautiful pattern. And you imagine, whoa, that's how it impacts, you know, that specific sound impacts to my body and the water inside of my cell. You know, um, so that's, um, I think we're entering a very interesting um, part of the science. More. Yeah. So speaking of science and sound and different cultures, is there any particular music system within soccer culture? Because I think in the West, it's a certain um, system, right? And I think it's like, I think 4, 432 or 440 hertz, one of those two where everything is tuned to. Is, is there anything like, like that in the soccer culture? Um, so there is a very interesting, we don't have, just tuning It's all about classical. I would say when you want to arrange, the, the, out of chaos, you want to create a harmony, right? Uh, in soccer culture, everything uh, that we follow is the natural cycles and natural sounds. So the main string instrument is a horse we call it krimpa it's a two string or even one three sometimes but mostly two and uh the horse hair um is just itself creates like a polyphonic almost like a uh, a collective sound 
the voices of people when they uh, sing Ohai. That's a lead singer, and everybody else repeats after that. And it's from elders to kids and men and women, and their voices collectively becomes this like um very harmonized but at the same time it's not perfectly tuned that you would experience in classical it's very human it's very primal very human uh, sound and that what horse uh, uh hair mimics when you play krimpa and another instrument is a, a mouth harp and one of my favorite. It's a shamanic instrument that e exists around the world. There are over 100 different types of this instrument. We call it homus, not humus, homus. Um, and um, it made from the material of the environment where the specific ethnicity lives on. Let's say we make it from iron. It's made from indigenous blacksmith. My great-grandfather -grand was a, a blacksmith. Um, and then in Japan, they make it from bamboo. Uh, in other cultures, they make it from bones or wood. And it's just the one string that vibrates. And perhaps it came from the sound of the bow of the hunters. So, um, Have you heard of this instrument called the berimbau? Which one? Uh, it's called the berimbau. In capoeira, they... Oh, yeah, capoeira. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they use that. Um, it's called the berimbau. And mm -hmm. the sound that it makes sounds like a relative to the sound that you're referring to yeah and it was around the world that's how you know all of our ancestors were tapping with something mysterious and perhaps communicating with unseen worlds yeah amazing what what you mentioned earlier about the harmonizing and um having a human sound makes me think of times when I've, I've seen music producers you know they're they're in this, this super stereo room everything's perfectly tuned there's like bass traps everywhere and 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 there's like no inspiration left in that room just because it's it feels like you're inside a phone box, right? Where uh, that some some other people are like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna make music in a actually in a real place where I want to hang out in. I want to be part of it. There's sun coming through. There's like like so all this, there's like um airness, right? And not just like so perfect all the time. Is, is that kind of what you mean by by more more human, more organic? Yeah, it's uh, almost. Um, I see the whole you know cycle cycles in the bigger and smaller scales as a, a song each cycle has its own song and each scale has its own rhythm and um, following the natural cycles of life weather and environment um, your homeland your this, this piece of area where you live and then your own natural body via like biorhythm right your own melody it's always, for me, um, very healthy. And that's where you feel, um, I think, the most connected. And uh, within that, you can find your own sound healing, your own tones versus um, processed through digital, you know, um, equipments, which I'm not uh, against. I just don't like to be against things. I like learning from things. Um, and, um, the digital world, um, it's just something that cleans it and, um, makes it so perfect that sometimes we, uh, become numb to the certain tones. Yeah. The word that comes to mind for me is sterile. Yeah. Sterilizing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you tell a petri dish, like it's Polished. perfect. Yeah sterilizing but from that perfect when it becomes so perfect and ai also when it it already creates music right um so when ai would do that it would be like a copy of copy and it, it, it's boring and uh from when one energy rises up another the counter energy rises up too to balance it out so i think where we're gonna witness is we will be uh heading towards natural which yeah. i'm happy about i i've seen and um observing myself too and other people share this opinion where let's say you create a, a beat inside um i don't know ableton or something like that mm -hmm. and it's like perfectly on time every single time and 
versus a human playing it. Well, the human has like a slight slight swing to how fast or how slow it is. Huh? But somehow, even though it's not perfect, it just feels better listening to that slight variation to, uh, of a human playing versus like his here's perfectly the same beat on every same same perfect timing every single time. You know, there's a one trick uh, for the music producers when you uh, put the uh, the rhythm um, when you actually create rhythm, not a sample, right, or loop. Uh, some people put it a little bit like out of the of the um upbeat or downbeat just a little bit um not perfect and it creates this sense of you know life drum and uh, yeah pe people who create music on their laptop can manipulate and create it artificially in order to mimic the natural <laughs> drummer <laughs> so it's, it's it's interesting <laughs> when mimicking natural right now is like because it's too digital, too perfect. Yeah, agreed. Would you be willing to share some some more singing techniques? And then from that, maybe we can watch one of your videos and uh, maybe you can provide some commentary and do a play-by-play -play on like what is being demonstrated or what you're feeling in that moment. Yeah, so there are a singing technique, as I mentioned before, kalhach, which is a head, head sound on top of your chest uh, lice and and it's just like creates the groove like ah, ah, ah. this is like a yodel type of and you don't break the fundamental um the fundamental chest sound ah, it's going on ah, versus ah, it's in there you can cut it right uh so that's a kalahach Another one is uh, tangalai, which literally means uh, palate. And um, it's... And this... It's actually mimicking of um, a crane bird. They do that sound a little bit. And also Raven does that too a little bit. So it all comes from mimicking birds and animal sounds. Another palette is... Um, Alaska. So it's... I'm inhaling and, and then pushing um, the palette with the top of my tongue. That creates kind of rhythm too yeah so those are um three singing techniques that i mostly use in my um performances and of course um can i call the birds and animal sounds as a singing techniques i have no idea i haven't thought about that but it's something that i quite often use for my uh performances in order to fall into trance and call my totem animals and embody that in shamanism mimicking is used for uh, uh not a boring borrowing but more like awakening the skills the special skill of certain animal let's say if it's owl it has a night vision rotating head 360 or flying quietly so if you want that super skill uh during your journey you can do the owl sound and turn into that because the sound as a language you embody it and you become an owl you know it, it's um, something that alters me for the animal sounds is that something that more people in Saka culture do or is it something that you kind of really just took on no, there are people who uh, mimic birds and animal sounds, and it's quite often um, uh, comes to people who are allowed to do that, that they are gifted to do, or, or they are in a special mission. It's not an entertainment. Um, it's not for fun. It's actually, as I told you, as I mentioned you before, it's a part of shamanism. And when I do that, it helps me to fall into trance. And, and have a special skill. Yeah, uh, definitely can't wait to get into that side with you. 
first, let's come back um, full circle to what I mentioned earlier about how I first discovered you, with the, which is uh, through the uh, Human Behavior Cover with New York. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, can you say, you know, what what prompted you to want to explore that song or that artist to um, cover? Yeah, Bjork, um, such a, as you mentioned before, it's it's a hard to make a cover, but for me it was always close, like easy, I would say. Um, and in Bjork, I just admire her art, and that particular song, Human Behavior, was made for America's Got Talent as a second option for uh, after Cranberry's song. Because uh, one of the uh, rules there for America's Go Talent, uh, you come up with cover. And uh, Cranberries, Zombie by Cranberries, it was just like perfect. We got four yeses. And for the next uh, level, we needed to cover another song. And I gave Human by Rag and Bone, um, Frozen by Madonna. And human behavior by by Bjork, and I love to Bjork, and but producers didn't take it because uh, it was something not popular. They wanted a popular song, so that video, particular video, was made for producer to show it how we would cover it. So we had kind of a purpose to do that. And of course, um, for me, it's always hard to find out the good song with good lyrics. And uh, Bjork, Bjork was just like option number one, like, oh, I'm going to do her. Um, and the way Andreas played there, the drum, more like a heavy bass, electronic, is something really different. And it's, it's, it's heavy and, uh, uh, you know, it's it's something that not everybody would like, but people really uh, find it um, as a as a beautiful like it's it's heavy and beautiful at the same time, which is hard to do, you know. Yeah. So um, let's watch that video in a second. But I'm curious about how how that how your version ended up came, coming out, meaning. Did you have an idea or was it uh, like an impromptu collaboration and then that just happened? So Andres picked up samples and I told him, yeah, we're going to do just live, live drum. And he um, has an ability to control bass and drum, drum kits, right? Both playing both and triggering some strings. So like a one person orchestra. He, he's also throating at the same time, right? And at the same time throating, yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's a- I know. <laughs> <laughs> no pre-recorded sounds at all. Uh, yeah, you have no idea how many times I played that video and I'm like, hey, this guy's drumming and throating at the same time. I had to point it out, right? I, I don't think you realize what's all that's happening. <laughs> yep. That's a multi-talent, so talented person. and. Um, it just came out. We didn't, you know, rehearse that much. It wow. was just, I already knew how I'm going to be singing in my style. And then he already has own style, own samples. It's more like a, his style and my style merging together and being like a, as a very beautiful cover. I have um, experience from watching some of my dance teachers. So like I can not, not say that I can label it, but I can get a sense or tell when someone is connected to the source in the artistry, whether the way that they're, they're dancing or um, coming through. So my my phrase for that is like the, the truth in motion, right? When I see it in dance. So when I saw you in that video, I was like, all right, she's connected to source. I, 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 I can feel it, you know, the way that you were performing that song. Yeah. So are you cool with doing a play-by-play on that song? <laughs> it was in the garage. <laughs> Oh, really? That's a garage. That's awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah. Great things happen in the garage, I'm telling you. Exactly. <laughs> what was that? The Apple or uh, Microsoft was created in a garage? Uh, Amazon. <laughs> like Amazon, Google. Oh. Yeah. Those are all sounds of Animals and birds in Arctic Siberia. Like a polar bear. What were you feeling in this moment? I just going through the uh, the Arctic Siberian environment, like almost like a flying 
like a light flying back to home. And then horse. Yeah, it's everything is just very imaginative. And it gives me confidence and like I prepare I'm prepared for singing that song in English, you yeah. know. I'm like going back to the source, to my ancestors. And then the reindeer breath. And then here. And I was controlling the uh, effects there on my voice and on him too. Oh, I see. Sometimes, yeah. Saha singing technique in it, like in Web of Life. Yeah. <laughs> Andres. Yeah, it's amazing that he's throat singing. Ring your breath and throat singing. Time. His throat singing, yeah. A little drop. That's an inhale. <laughs> All an inhale. I hope a Yorke sees this, if not already, at some point. I feel like she would be really proud. I should push this video on socials. I love this video. I've watched it so many times. <laughs> Half your views apart from me. <laughs> I like the ending here. It, it's, it's super amazing that uh, Andreas is drumming, but his exertion doesn't come through from how how much you know how, how active he is, right? Because like you, you start breathing hard from being active, but he just constant the whole time. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's really amazing. It's a it's a lot of. Um, years of training and he um, he's Ar Armenian Greek um, he's from Sochi the southern part of Russia so he was um, playing percussion when he was four years old and going with his grandmother at the weddings and accompanying her while she was playing oud the string and singing and he was little you know, boy playing. Uh, that's rhythm. amazing. Maybe, maybe Andreas. Maybe one day you come on the show. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. So, like, you, you're saying this is all. Like, this is mostly impromptu. That's amazing. Like, that's yeah. That's re really good. Uh, I, I don't know what your other days look like, but that was like a super on day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, and it's all in the garage. <laughs> yeah. Here, here in Bay Area. Oh, really? It's in Bay Area. Yep. Oh, wow. Area. Okay. Nice. Famous garage. Right? Speaking about wildfires, there's always, you know, a natural cycle that Earth renews and it just happens, it should happen to open up space. Um, and um, something like caused by human, uh, if it becomes non controllable and if it becomes devastating and uh, takes over the natural uh, inhabited of the animals the children of earth yeah it's just something we need to really uh, address and uh, music is is amazing tool to deliver those messages yeah this web of life 
it's truly about that everything is interconnected and every single thought and action uh, and word we speak, um, it has an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. I'm, I'm glad uh, you're doing the work towards spreading that message. Let's jump over to culture and spirituality within Saka culture, right? Uh, what is the creation lord within Saka culture? So we have um, something like it called heroic epic, Olonho. And it's a storytelling that lasts for two or three days and nights nonstop. Wow, that's amazing. And it's quite often uh, created by a shaman after their journey, they come back to their bodies and they... Um, uh, it's like a form of poetry that includes song and dancing and embodying all of these characters. And there could be over 50 different characters. It could be, you know, woman, spirit, shaman, animal, and uh, the storyteller, Olong Kohot, embodies each of them. And um, I call it uh, actually controlled schizophrenia. <laughs> because, yeah, it's just something that and we don't see we don't give a diagnosis you know if there's a mental health issue we see it as like a um an energy going through the body and shaman is the person who learns how to deal with that energy how not being overtaken but actually negotiating and even um collaborating in order to retrieve very important information and data from web of life back to the community. And um, so the heroic epic along Ho contains all the form of folklore and all the singing techniques and everything and storytelling how the universe war was born. And we have a concept of three worlds, lower, middle and higher. So it usually starts from description of the universe and um, there are deities of the higher world, 12 different deities. And the brother of um, Urung Artoyon, um, it's it somehow, you know, um, became the opposite energy and then created, descended to the lower world. And then, and then there are like a two forces, opposite forces, you know, um, constantly battling, but at that battle, for us, it's more, almost like a dancing because um, only in a dance you can see the wholeness of cycle. You don't deny like or push away the the lower world energy, which is for us a um, destructive, like a darkness, death, harmful. But it's truly a uh, something that. Um, keeps the light shining only in the darkness you can see the light and the middle world our physical world it's it's a combination of both energies and uh two opposite energies dancing with each other so it's a uh, constant in and out um constant ups and downs um and um yeah in a heroic epic we um, have this long, long, long storytelling. Usually it's about the, the, um, the, uh, battle between two, two forces, but it has a lot of, you know, let's say, um, uh, each character has own, uh, power. So it can be, it, it's so sophisticated, the language in Saha, uh, in Olongho is so sophisticated that it can even describe each character for many, many pages. It became later written, right? So, but the storyteller could spend um, like an, a lot of minutes, uh, like a 30 minute to describe just one object. And it's very psychedelic. You know, so, uh, earlier you mentioned that it's 50 characters and it's nonstop. Is the whole story being told by one person? Yeah, just the one person. Okay, so would it be fair to say that this is part of a big ceremony and it doesn't happen casually? Like there's there's a, either an event or a special time where this story is being told? 
So very good question. It's, uh, you know, when Olong Hohut comes in a certain neighborhood in Alas, people usually would hear about that and they go, oh, Olong Hohut is coming, the storyteller is coming. And they would go there and would take them two, three days on horse, you know, as I told you. And usually uh, Olong Ho st storyteller um, does it in front of uh, a fire and people come. And it was the, the sort of, you know, entertainment too, because uh, no internet, no TV, it's imagination. It's the power of imagination. Yeah. And then that's how all of our ancestors were actually um, creating the whole, you know, entertainment by making your imagination to dance. And um, I think that's what we're losing today. And imagine living in cold environment without electricity, just gathering everyone by the fire. And there's a lot of wisdom in that storytelling too. It's uh, through entertainment, you actually teach future generation. It truly has a very survival um, healing um, purpose in each, you know, storytelling. Is there any similarity as far as permission and lineage from shamans and storytellers? Like, that, does does it, does the role of a storyteller get passed on to somebody? Oh yeah, by genes. And uh, shamans are the people who, first of all, have a bloodline, a straight bloodline, and they have to be chosen by spirit, we say. And in fact, that they're chosen means they have no choice. They um, go through the devastating pain. Uh, it's called Saha um, Garuta, or um, it's a rite of passage called Etteni. So they're, they experience in their dreams how their bodies are eaten um, by the spirit of the lower world and they build new body, they leave the bones and the bones are taken care of by one-eyed and one-legged and one-handed woman. So, so they can consume? It's something that, you know, becoming a completely different person. In this case, becoming a shaman. Transform. Transform, the, yeah, it's a transformation. And uh, when new body is built in a dream state, all of a sudden the person who was in agony in a great sickness, uh, they become healthy and they start healing other people. And yeah, it's, it might have a really devastating symptoms of, you know, very similar to schizophrenia, epilepsy, uh, non-diagnosed, like you don't know the nature of the pain that, that is in the physical body seizures, losing consciousness. Um, and then some of the um, shamans, future shamans who couldn't handle that rite of passage, they would die. They would die uh, during the process. It's really a burden. It's not a something, uh, something that, you know, easily today people claim themselves as a shamans and it's not that easy and we don't have a plant medicine too it's all comes from natural altering state of consciousness it's uh something that hits person without even asking from your permission and without your intention or your plan um if you have it in your genes most likely you become a shaman and then you have to learn for months, years, even decades, how to become a shaman. Well, you said a lot of interesting points there. Uh, let me try to go through them one at a time. So you said that shamans uh, or certain um, people get chosen, right? So I'm curious about what your opinion or um, how the idea of like fate or free will is represented in saga culture. Is destiny a big part versus, you know, you're free to do whatever you want? It's a very good question. So every single person's experience is unique. And um, all the shamans, it's, it's almost like imagine taking ayahuasca um, and having bad trip. And then every single person's journey is unique to depends on their situation, right? And their chemistry in the body and their narrow 
patterns that are already built um, and their experience from their childhood. It all comes together in that journey. And uh, so the shaman, um, shaman's experience is unique, but um, it has overall one storytelling and it's very similar to each other. So there's some notion of, is that the place where they visit? Is, is it something fundamental there? Or we're all completely, you know, individuals or we're collective. And um, because there's no written book in Saha faith, um, there's no Bible or something. It's um, all, you know, oral and it all based on human experience and based on environment. And then perhaps because of, you know, the location, shamans would experience things in a, a certain things in a similar way. But as a, as a human beings, we all experience it in an in in individual way. And uh, we have, as I mentioned before, we have 12 sky, 12 different skies, and each sky has deity. It's all in upper world. We had I do. And each deity is responsible for human problems. There's a even Jolcha, Jolcha Khan, which is Jolcha means destiny. Um, it's a, uh, I think it's a nine sky, the nine sky um, deity. And let's say there's Yeyachsit Khotun, it's a first sky deity. Yeyachsit, it's a love. There's a Ayyihut, which is fertility. There's a Alam Lachsan Khotun, which is the protector of female energy, and it comes as a cow. Then the fourth sky, it's a Jehugay Ayyi, which is, it comes like a, a horse embodiment of the horse. It's a protector of masculine. So each deity has a own um, sort of definition behind that. And we look at, look at it as an energy that bigger than us. And maybe the layers on the skies, like lithosphere, stratosphere, you know, and Uring Artoyon, it's a 12th sky, it's the highest. And I grew up... Uh, I grew up praying, I grew up believing in Uring Artoyon so much. Every single time when I get into trouble, I lose something, I would just fall into my knees facing east and just having, you know, asking help to find out my silver earring or something because I knew that my mom is going to be sad. It always helped me. So I had this, such a, an intimate connection with Uring Artoyon and I thought it's like a long bearded white long haired you know elder like a man more masculine energy to me but in fact uh, when i grew up i realized that it's more about everything and nothing all at once Irene Arto and it's like a everything and nothing is happening all at once and i'm like whoa <laughs> so does that mean like there's a duality and also a singularity there like the yeah, duality, duality becomes singularity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm curious, you mentioned three worlds and 12 deities. Uh, is there any concept of karma or reincarnation within Saka beliefs? Yeah, so um, if I um, continue describing these three worlds, um, its lower world has a hostile spirit, Abahe. Uh, middle world has a, a uh, spirit of, you know, more the tangible world, uh, but we don't see them too. Uh, it's invisible to human eyes. We call them ichi, and it's all mostly uh, related to, you know, like ichi could be in the house, in the land. Um, also, the elements like water and fire ha have also ichi, and then the higher world deities we call them ayu. So abahe. Ichi and Ai. So when uh, man transitions, uh, transits in, into different world, um, we believe that the uh, soul, we bury them under the ground. But it has also um, an impact from Christianity. 
on 17th century, we had an impact from Christianity. Before we were burying people up the ground because we have a permafrost. And it was like a grave on the pole. Um, but the way we bury shamans never changed. So today you can see a lot of, you know, in a forest there are, in the remote places there are graves of the shamans, which are arangas, and they are on the pole. Uh, the way we bury non, uh, the, the, sh the people who are not shamans, uh, it became like underground. And um, it just preserves here a long time because it's cold in the permafrost, right? It's like a refrigerator. And um, we believe after death, people, um, the soul comes out, leaves the, leaves the body, and um, it should not stay in the middle world. Uh, it should go to higher world. And um, so the people who passed earlier than they, they're supposed to be, let's say, let's say being suicidal, for example, they stay in the middle world and become your. It's almost like a parasitic um, spirit that becomes, that c can um, be attached to people and they can also cause the problems. Um, so it's uh, very interesting. We don't have a particular, like uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, like a reincarnation that would keep coming back. And I, I need to dig down on, on that aspect and kind of see the pre-Christianity, uh, what they're saying about it. Um, but um, we don't have a right like a reincarnated Lama or something like that. So it's, uh, we believe that people just go to the higher world or they go to the lower world, depends on what they, you know, um, how they navigate, what they kind of um, gain during the lifetime. And there's an interesting deity called um, this Jilhatoyon, which is the destiny, and also Hunjorantai Soroksut, which is um, the writer of destiny. So it feels like um, whatever you did, it stays. It's like archived, and it's a, it's a writer of the destiny. And for me, it feels like a karma. So that whatever you did, it stays, but the destiny is the same. <coughs> It's a destiny for all of us. It's a death. It's like a transition. The concept of karma is like that, that etching into the permanent um, archive. Is that? Uh, yeah. There's a special deity that writes everything that you thought and, and said and acted upon. So it's just, um, I call it as a karma. <laughs> Very similar to karma. Yeah, very interesting. What what are um, so definitely ancestors are very important within Saka culture, right? How do you learn to listen to the ancestors? Um, it's a I would say it's a gift that we all have. It's intuition, and uh, intuition it's a memory um, that is preserved in your DNA. And it comes, um, the DNA that we carry, it's, uh, we carry even DNA of animals, like something primordial. You can see it in evolution, being inside of the mother's womb. Uh, we have a tail, we, be, we will look like reptile, and then all of a sudden during the uh, nine months, we become human. Uh, and we carry all of talents and skills and suffering and happiness all all the information of the previous generations of the, of the ancestors which are our ancestors and um it's a it's a responsibility and being able to have access to those codes to those uh dna and and particularly to the knowledge the memory that they had and in the memory as i mentioned 
it could be a pain. That's why some people also already being born with ancestral trauma. And we have even shamans who can heal at that level. They can heal ancestral trauma. Um, they can go back for many, many generations and and they can go for many generations back and, and uh, block the energy there. Being able to hear voice of ancestors, it's being able to hear your intuition and relying and trusting in it. And which I am, you know, um, trying to bring to this Western culture. There are certain English words such as attention, intuition, observation, uh, that actually has very shamanic, very deep meaning behind that. And taking for granted those words, it weakens our own skills. Can you explain some of that meaning? So as an intuition, intuition for me, it's a listening to your ancestor's voice. Intuition, it's a superpower that we all have. Something that kicks in first and you, you rely on it and trust and you act upon that then all of a sudden you made really easiest choice or your path uh, became easier and you're like oh I listened to my intuition I was right so it's like following ancestors voice um, at attention attention actually um, it's like it opened up attention is something that attaches you to the certain realm and it it's like a when you focused with your attention it opens up the portal so it's like a door you open up um and then imagination imagination creates the entire world once you open up that portal so for me those three english words they are uh, very shamanic and then this, the last thing is, is the intuition. Once you are in that world, you hear your ancestor voice, ancestor's voice and bring it back to your body uh, after the journey. So these three stages are very important. And we've been doing it all the time. We've just forgotten how to use them, perhaps the sequences, and we've forgotten how to trust in them. Wow, that was really deep. Very well said. How did you connect these three dots? I'm, I think I'm just uh, very, very grateful to the environment where I was born and to my ancestors, the whole lineage that I never been thought like, oh, you should do this and that. And uh, it just happened naturally by surrendering to the uh, environment and cycle of life. Otherwise, you can't survive. You die uh, it's all, you know, uh, happening at the present time. Uh, you are constantly between life and death back in my, in my homeland. So, and then you have to learn it naturally. Otherwise, yeah, it's a natural selection. My grandfather was one of the seven survivors among 12 children and mortality, mortality of children was really, really high. Two generations behind me, um, and today we comfort ourselves too much. And um, if we didn't have this comfort with, without using this three, attention, imagination, and intuition, uh, without using them properly, perhaps we would die. <laughs> That's actually a good point. It, uh, uh, it brings us back to what we were talking about earlier uh, regarding, you know, with social media and our phones, things are constantly taking away our attention, <laughs> intention and intuition. And, you know, with that filling our imagination with like, oh, yeah, you should buy this thing. You, sh you want this thing. This is how you should look like. Right. Yeah. So it's um, it's it's really cool to see you explain that and see how immediately even in modern society, we're definitely going away from um, those three. Yeah, intention. I really like that too. So I'm creating this whole vocabulary of the English words and bringing meaning, the shamanic meaning behind that. I love the way you said intention because intention that what is mission. Basically, uh, attention, portals are open, imagination. You are all of a sudden in this world, right? Then intuition. Oh, and then 
uh, intention, which is, I, okay, I'm in this world. What is my purpose? What I'm going to do, right? What is my mission? So it creates the whole path and purpose why, why you are doing this. And intuition along that path, you have to trust for the information that comes to you. And there's something that we're missing here too, like something that we, for coming back to body, to this reality, we need another word. So I'm just thinking about that. It will come to me. I've been, you know, designing all of this uh, since I'm learning English, you know, I'm, I'm learning from people who I'm communicating and from the uh, small communities, which I really believe those people really know what they need and they're really close to nature. Yeah, that's a great segue to my next question is, how does the Saka culture view education? And the reason why I bring it up is, it's very easy for Western societies uh, to be like, oh, this country or this, uh, these people don't, don't have the same um, standards of skill sets that we do. So therefore, they're uneducated. But I don't agree with that personally, because you know, education can mean so many things. It doesn't have to mean this exact thing that this one country decides for everybody else. So, like, what are what are some things that um, it's foundational to the Saka education? Whether it's like it could be something like, oh, um, your ability to live off the land, your ability to live a life without waste, or something like that. You know, simply my answer would be the great teacher here is nature, and our elders they learned from nature too, right? Um, and they're passing their knowledge to to future generation. Um, the education, when it becomes systemized, it's actually put in a box, and there is something that oblige people um, to become part of the system. And perhaps that is good for survival of that particular system, and to have a a long life of longevity of, of, of that particular system. But um, I don't think it's um, for humanity, like for, for us to uh, live long and deepen into mystery of life because most of the um, educational systems, they don't teach you how to, um, you know, connect to the spirituality and, to the unknown part of, you know, human experience and the whole cosmos and universe. It's something that we call it philosophy or religions, belief systems. Um, and they're not taught at schools. And But today, what I really love about is today we have all kind of, you know, like education became decentralized. It is becoming decentralized. And today we can learn from our neighbor. We can learn from our best friend or from uh, someone who we really admire their talent, um, which I'm really, really happy about. And there are so many tools to learn uh, through, um, such as, you know, internet has that part, you know, of education became accessible. It's from human to human. But there's also this, another tool, uh, I call it connection, straight to the source in nature. And that's how I grew up learning from nature. You know, even I was comforted by, you know, I was born in a warm house with electricity, but the presence of nature is so, so, you know, powerful there. It's obvious that nature is important to Saka culture. So with things like global warming happening, how, how does that affect the Saka people? So for example, you mentioned that um, there's permafrost there. So you guys use the ground as a refrigerator, right? But mm -hmm. if the ground's no longer cold or yeah, how does that affect um, the people? So there is a memory from uh, underground refrigerator. Um, so we store there our um, ice, the drinking water and meat and berries and fish. And I remember just putting tons of layers of you know, uh, fur coat to go down just to grab your food and to cook. And it's just, I really, really didn't like it. Today we can open up, uh, you know, door of the refrigerator. 
and with one hand movement you already get your food um yeah it just took a longer time and more effort uh this is still like that we we have small refrigerator but for stock like for for the whole entire you know survival uh during the year you need to store it under the ground um so the major problem that we're witnessing it's uh, when temperature uh, go goes high the permafrost melts and it's so obvious we see it how you know there are pictures before and after there are a lot of researches happening in my homeland on climate change and one of the main problems what the scientists came up with it's not about uh you know us staying without food or something it's about actually a more global problem which is they're saying there are there are bacteria over there that are there were you know on the on, on the ice like permafrost that are perhaps well preserved and they might come out that's a great point yeah and that is kind of scary because of you know we went through this lockdown all of this interesting little creatures that are part of li our lives and perhaps if our generations are not strong to create and create antibodies in and have not enough strong uh, immune system then it can cause you know um something to humanity and uh, who to knows honest, to be honest with you that scares the hell out of me because anything that i read about from hundreds thousands millions of years ago is super big so meaning like Imagine if something that was living off dinosaurs got unfrozen on the bacteria level and came after us. I'm like, uh, uh, not not up for it. <laughs> yeah, if if it survives to this environment, yeah. if if something changes in in the temperature, and you see like slight little change that just you know makes other species extinct, um, instinct. Yeah, cause, extinct. Cause, yeah, extinct. Because okay. the, the way I, I see it is like. Even right now, if Americans go to, say, Vietnam or Mexico and they drink the water there, most likely they're going to get diarrhea because their system, not, not, not to say that the, the food there or anything is bad, but the system is not even used to it, mm -hmm. to something that's, that's here in this timeline right now versus something from thousands of millions of years ago. Yep, exactly. And that would happen to my people too. When Russians discovered us, they brought all kind of, you know, viruses and infections that we didn't have immunity against of it. And, um, you know, there was uh, smallpox and uh, arang. It's a really, uh, when, when, it's, it's like arang, it's a, when your body literally melts. It was really, really weird epidemic um and um uh, so yeah i can s totally see how um something unknown can cause uh such a devastating uh changes in in human life and then shamans were saying you know that sometimes hostile spirits are it is not like a ghost or you know the energy that you can see like a phantom like a uh, shadows or something it could be also bacteria <laughs> there they, you cannot see them with naked eyes but we invented microscope to see them and we'll re-enter that world and we can actually manipulate we we are with our science the technology that we invented we can uh create even bacteria and create antibacterias um and viruses all of these small worlds um and then shamans without those you know microscopes before it was invented they already knew about it they already knew about the existence of these little creatures that cause sickness to us and um you know and then shamans also the 12 sky shamans they can um communicate with the realms where the atoms molecules operate on and they can impact so it's it's very very interesting how and in some shamans they can work with the weather they can bring the rain during the dry season and um i just always wonder is there a uh, you know 
is is it a time where we as a collective can come together and and then just create this collective prayer for connecting to the certain power and forces that operate on a very sophisticated way um even smaller than neutrons and electrons and uh can we um slow down uh this climate change or can can we leave our can we keep our home clear you know it just starts from um very simple as individuals being aware and not trashing and being aware of the whole how the whole system of like a sustainability works and then sharing that knowledge and creating communities and creating infrastructure for community and then infrastructure for the communities to come together so for me it's like a collective prayer it's it's something as a metaphor i see it all sitting together and singing one song but it needs actions what are your thoughts on the preservation of indigenous culture in the Sakha Republic I, i just read the other day that i think 99% of russia's diamond mines are in Sakha Republic and mm-hmm. there's all these giant mines uh yeah so that's obviously a big concern so what what are your thoughts on that So and it's it's a 99% and also 20% of the worldwide diamond mining of the De Beers company. So Alrosa was uh, first a national company we were owning 51% of um uh, controlled shares. Um but we lost it. Um most of the companies, mining companies, they um belong to more like um federal or what, like individual certain individuals. and that became a burden for my people uh we don't benefit with, from from those companies as we supposed to and living in that harsh conditions i think every single saha person just being born there and living and protecting the borders of the country uh we need to have um a comfortable environment i mean the every single person at least needs to have a, like a reindeer shoes or warm clothes subsidize it subsidize it like supported from government or you know my dream is to have house warm house people are poor there and also we have ability in ability to like resources there are so so huge and living above that it just became our burden um and it's it is also very raw you know um the environment there is so like severe that trying to bring technology uh and trying to mine it's it's a little slow which is i'm i'm happy about and i call it as a natural defense of the nature it's like it's it's like a moat right a moat around the Saka Republic where the harsh cold is uh very very difficult to deal with but it also keeps unwanted individuals out exactly and it's like a mosquitoes in the summer <laughs> you know i really really don't like mosquitoes um uh we have in july they can even kill the reindeer they can really? go inside of the nostril and wow. it just swollen the reindeer can't breathe uh yeah how its little creatures can be so powerful But coming back to the mining companies overall in arctic circle um th- those reindeer is actually losing their um inhabited areas where they actually live off and they migrate they follow food and people nomadic reindeer herders our neighbors and then we, we share their genes too uh they are so dependent from reindeers and now their quantities are going down and those people are losing their culture their tradition it's 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 happening all over and um our region is so so rich by gas oil diamond gold silver uranium titanium almost the entire mendeleev's table and uh we really need to come up with special laws and and programs and something that we need to like stand 
and I'm perhaps learning um, learning from others um, countries where indigenous people have a control of their mineral resources. Um, that's why um, I've been I started to being very curious about you know Native Americans and uh, the history here is really 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 sad and uh, horrible compared to mine. In my homeland, there was no, you know, like killing and taking taking scalp off. Scalping, yeah. Scalping. Uh, there were some battles, but um, my people actually created later friendship because it was impossible to beat Russians. And um, on the contrary, we actually gave abakayada as a symbol of friendship. Mary, uh, the Saha woman married Russian men. And it's a symbol in our main square, one of the main square in, in Yakutsk city as a friendship. And sometimes it's very important to be, you know, gentle and be smarter over the situation where you know that they're going to just destroy you. And for the long run, it's smarter and wiser to to do friendship and we are right now 500,000 people, Saha people all over the world. And of course, main population live in, in Saha. And um, our, I think the culture dies when the language dies. As soon as, as, as long as we speak our, you know, language and carry the traditions and shamans, uh, even there were just, um, oppressed for many waves for for a long time they were secretly healing people it's all out of necessity so our culture survived through that survived through a lot of um, impacts from Russians and we're we're friends we uh, we have 40 percent of population Russians 50 percent Saha 10%, uh, you know, we have Armenians coming, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz people, even Chinese people, um, like a different ethnicities coming and uh, learning and also, yeah, working, <laughs> building, <laughs> because constantly moves, the permafrost melts and doing roads and everything, like building uh, houses, the construction, it's all, yeah, it's it's uh, made by other. Yeah, it, it seems to be a very sensitive and delicate issue while also being very complex at the same time because you mentioned there's that um, the temperature mode, right, That's, that keeps others out because I can't think of anybody that I know of uh, that would volunteer to go into negative 94 and, and live there. Not to say that it's like not livable because you obviously come from that culture, right? That mode is keeping people out, but it's also keeping away the infrastructure that might help that population. While at the same time, the infrastructure might bring un unwanted guests to develop in the area and take away the natural resources. And it's, it's a shame that um, the people who live on this land, which is so plentiful, are not benefiting from what the land provides and someone else is like uh, funneling it out pretty much. Yeah, I always say, you know, rubas uh, it means a uh, fish gets spoiled from the head. So that's why whatever is happening in the outside world, focusing in what, you know, true for us, like uh, focusing on power that is in the center here in the, in at the very core, it's important. And um, I think... This is like a perfect time when, you know, the whole humanity is going through the lower world, very shamanic, going through the pain and suffering. And and when we hit the button, we can uh, come out as a phoenix, like being reborn and become even more powerful. So I kind of believe in that shamanic, you know, uh, way that the whole cycle moves in and out and out in the bigger cycles where it feels like we're heading towards the, you know, catastrophe or some apocalypse or something huge should happen that people will wake up or something. Um, and then it feels like an end of civilization. No, it's, it's just, um, 
on a bigger scale, it needs to be like that in order to keep moving. If someone were to visit the Saka Republic, what's what are some things that they should keep in mind in order to be respectful of their visit? So, for example, one one thing I noticed here on the West, meaning America, is there's like a, a huge interest in healing uh, modalities right now, and then a lot of people are calling themselves shamans and even offering shaman workshops. Like you know, you can be a shaman in one weekend or it's you know with this certificate you know so it's, it's like taking away from other cultures but not knowing anything about the lineage or where it comes from so that's already disrespectful right thank you for asking this question i i think as a very humble nation by nature we always like asking permission when we even go to the nature and we believe that the area has a local spirits and we do certain ceremony um, and we ask permission from the spirit of fire. We give certain food that we cooked. We give the white beverage, which is kumus fermented horse milk, or birpach, which is fermented cow milk. So we come there with some offering, and um, you know, if someone goes back to, if someone visits my homeland. Having that, you know, very fundamental that all indigenous people carry this permission, the humbleness. Permission creates the humbleness. And uh, having that, it slows down speed. And then you, you have more space and time to be observant. And then when you are observant, you learn a lot. And once you learn... Uh, from different culture and we want to share that uh, if you want to share it's very important to create a reciprocity and um, that's why I'm you know planning to uh, create this whole we're working on app ed an educational creative app that highlights in, in indigenous people called Oloch app Oloch means life and I'm building the whole ecosystem um, I would like to come up with some blockchain, uh, come come out uh, putting the information where the education and knowledge wisdom uh, could be traceable and transparent where it comes from, seeing the origins. And it's not only for my people, it's for entire indigenous people. Um, so that would be very interesting to have that platform for indigenous people to feel safe and being able to share their knowledge and wisdom without hesitation. Um, so, and then always keeping in mind that indigenous people don't share everything and it's okay because uh, every knowledge has own time to be shared with and spread out there. Because if you, if you share everything, then... Um, if it's not the right time, it might be spoiled or even damage people. <laughs> it just transforms and it might be something um, that even uh, creates the counter energy. Uh, so that is that would be my... And of course, there's no bad weather. There's bad clothing if you plan to go to there. <laughs> and during the winter solstice, experiencing the extreme cold... Then uh, bring the warm, warm uh, clothes, or learning from uh, local people, and they 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 provide uh, warm. Yeah. So w what I am taking, or what I'm getting rather, from what you said earlier about how to interact with these communities, is the difference between taking and receiving. Mm -hmm. So taking, you're actively just reaching out and you're taking it, right? you're, you're grabbing it. But receiving meaning someone's given to you, meaning there's permission required. So come there with a receiving mindset rather than a taking mindset. Would that be fair to say that? Yeah, going there with an intention to give. And when you give, uh, it's easier to receive. And when you, re when you receive, you want to give back. So it's like constant, you know, dance of giving and receiving. And then once you... Um, learn how to give and receive, then you make the energy to flow easily and gently. Yeah, beautifully said. Uh, I, I only recently realized that 
there's tribes out there that uh, have reindeers as part of their daily life, and the Saka is one of them, right? It actually makes me curious about if this has some influence on the origins of Santa Claus, for example, you know? Um, I have to ask, have you ever rode on a reindeer? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, so the reindeers, actually, um, the reindeer herders are Chukchi, Yukagir, Even, Evenk people, and they're, um, we're horse people, Saka people, and we live together and we carry the same genes. We actually carry the genes of nomadic reindeer her herders and Mongolians. Um, so those people, uh, the reindeer herders are so, I'm really, really fascinated about their life because they are still, you know, live without electricity and all of this civilization um, tools. And I uh, first time rode a reindeer um, when I was 11, I think. Yeah, 11. And then the reindeer had <laughs> like <laughs> sound. And I thought, oh, what, what is he doing? Is he farting? <laughs> it was like a, every single time when he was doing the step, it was doing. <laughs> and I was saying, oh, what is this? And then a man, he told me, no, it's, it's, it's the way they breathe. And then that's what I do. Um, the reindeer breath, I call it the Arctic beatbox. <laughs> so it's a inward and uh, outward chest bass, according to beatboxing. And um, so the reindeers are so lovely. Um it's just a very survival animal. And because of reindeers, nomadic people survived till these days. And reindeers actually are, um, they're everything. And like horses too. We survived because of the horses. Nomadic people survived be because of the reindeers. Because their food, transportation, clothing, um, the horse of the uh the, the, the hair of horses were used to create robes uh, and reindeers also are house. So nomadic people use their leather to cover yaranga, to cover the poles that poured in a certain way. And it's like a yurt. It's like a yurt. Yeah. And, um, and it's portable house, <laughs> you know, it's incredible how, those animals, they sacrifice themselves for us to survive and become who we are without lo losing that much, you know, of our culture, still living in a very raw, traditional way. But the one thing is what is happening with nomadic people is their languages are dying. There are no ma not many people who speak. And one of the main um, missions of our app is also um teaching the rare languages that comes from indigenous people too that's, that's beautiful i love it uh because i i've been told that some native american tribes over here are protective of that language and they don't want outsiders to learn it so um i guess uh in your case it's, it's more open yeah it is open and then yeah when you protect and don't share i think there are two two different ways of protection you can share or don't share. Um, let's say keeping language alive means you want more people speaking, right? Uh, but it's also when you know the way how to do not transform it um, or spoil it, the language will be alive. So in the, again, trans transformation speaking about the whole you know languages that transform or let's say we try to preserve traditions traditions that we have today were innovations to the previous traditions and they replaced them because everything follows the cycle of earth and um imagine how many languages how many ethnicities were uh you know wiped out or transformed um, how many civilizations before us 
So it's, yeah, it's, it's something that overall, if I look at it on a bigger scale, I just surrender. But when you are here at this period of time in your lifetime, you want to, um, as much as preserve, as much, as much as cre uh, preserve the rawness in it and the connection to the nature, like everything that follows nature, it's very important and anything everything else other than that it's just comes and goes you know everything i think that directly connects with survival it stays longer it won't most likely won't change but it will change with the cycle of earth yeah so how i hear survival when you bring it up is Instead of survival, I hear the word sustainable. So to sustain something uh -huh. means to survive. And I think they go hand in hand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I have to jump back to the reindeers because I'm I'm very curious. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when, when you were riding on the reindeer, did it feel different than riding on the horse? Oh, yes. Yeah, tell me it's, what, it's, what it's, a, it's a kind of tiny. Um, it's not that tall, right? It's a different... Um, perception of life first um it's a, it, its spine is different the vertebrae and kind of um the the muscles in it there the reindeers are skinny <laughs> they're not like horses um and could, could, could anybody ride a reindeer or is something you have to be invited into like um there are certain um touristic organizations that allow anyone to ride reindeers but it would be just a uh, no like having a connection to the animal and having a little impression from it uh nothing nothing that would bring you into survival because riding a reindeer for survival it's a different because reindeers also uh they carry all the sled you know, the houses and all the tools. Um, basically, for the nomadic people, reindeers, um, it's a transportation that carries house too. And it is a house itself too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, so, it's so cool to learn that uh, reindeers are so integral to different cultures out there. In Japan, they have the Ainu, which is also indigenous uh -huh. to Japan. And I believe the Ainu is also a reindeer tribe. And I've seen in... Um, the movie Princess Mononoke. Uh -huh. um, there's y Yakut, right? And so I actually wonder if there's any connection between Yakut and Yakutia, because y Yakut is the, the the elk or reindeer that the main character rides in Princess Mononoke. Ah. Yeah. Well, I need to watch that. I watched it when I was really young. Um, which is in what interesting about Ainu people is they have the same songs and dancing and mimicking a crane because crane um the bird it's um it migrates from japan to arctic siberia oh, to mate and give babies and fly back to japan um and that's where it's one of the examples where birds that fly from one continent to another they can connect cultures and just you know uh, all of a sudden, you find similarities between the cultures, and then you start to to, to think, "Oh, do we carry the same genes?" And it could be carried by animals and birds that mig migrate, specifically birds, because they can fly over the ocean, right? So it's it's very interesting how birds could shape cultures. How does the Saka culture view things like ownership? So, you know, I, I know in some countries it's very nomadic, meaning you travel and you live off the land and you find your piece of land and you just kind of coexist with what's happening while in other countries it's like hey i'm gonna have a fence around my land and then this thing is mine no, nothing else can come here what's what's the uh, relationship to ownership in soccer culture yeah so before russians um it was exactly the same what you said they would find alas the open space in the middle of taiga deep forest with lake in it and uh, the reason it's open space because the permafrost is very closer to the um, surface and the roots of the trees cannot grow. 
And Saka people would just, one family would build their summer winter house. And uh, there is no like fencing, <laughs> you know. Um, but later, um, with the whole, you know, um, system that was integrated um, and created by Russians um, of owning land. Yeah, we, we do fences in the villages. Everyone has own um, house and it has a fences. And the houses, they have Russian style. Before the houses, you know, Balagan, it had like a 75 degree uh, of the wall that you can uh, insulate it with poop. So that you just cover it with poop. Today, it's a 90 degree. So it's a different style of house. And um, yeah, Saha Republic has own constitution, sovereignty, ministry, parliament. We had our own president before we lost that status. We have own Republican budget, uh, but later it just became more and more part of Russia and more and more dependent. Yeah, from from Moscow. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, I'm curious how you balance out your heritage to um, other cultures that you're a part of, like such as American culture. Like I think that's um, that's something that a lot of people struggle with, or finding how how to how to embrace your roots while still like recognizing that there's new ways to look at things. How do you, how do you balance the two? Memories that make me to to feel really happy and strong and remembrance of who I am and uh, remembrance of all of my five sensations once they were really sharp, where I was feeling really healthy. So um, that is automatically, like naturally uh, makes me to, to be Saha and to miss my homeland. And when you are far away, your love becomes so strong to your homeland, to your culture, to your family. And, uh, you know, the impact, as I mentioned before, anything that is happening outside, it doesn't matter or it doesn't um, impact you too much once you are very strong inside. And it's this... At the level of self-identification, when you can say, I am Saha, I am Vietnamese, it's almost has a protection to in it, like a, almost like a shield. And then, um, and then inside this gentle, soft spot where you feel, I am you, I am everyone, you know, um, that also makes you to not be... Uh, let's say that you allow the energy to flow. And then again, it comes into Uringar Toyon, the concept of everything and nothing all at once. So I am, uh, I see the world as a divided into layers. Like there's a seed, that seed that who we are, we're all connected, but there's certain layers, preconditions that we learned to protect ourselves in order to survive. Uh, those are also very important to look at it and learn from them. Yeah, beautifully said. Uh, you know, speaking of balancing new cultures, I know that you've attended Burning Man. Uh, I'm, I'm so curious about your particular experience because, you know, Burning Man over here is a harsh environment for a lot of people and they, they, they choose to go there while you come from a harsh environment like uh, for your homeland, right? So like, what's, what's, what's your experience with Burning Man? So there are similarities that <laughs> survival mode there, it's just a, nothing is there. And then during a couple of weeks, they create the whole, you know, uh, city with all the infrastructure. And you rely just on your skills. Um, and it's hot. It's the, like, the opposite. <laughs> it's the hottest place where I've ever been. To. <laughs> and um, it's a three worlds middle, lower and higher worlds all together. Um, and it's just a, something that I, I, you know, like a fantasy world, like something that um, it has 
some unbelievable element, almost like, are, are, am I in, you know, planet Earth? It feels like I'm in Mars or some, somewhere else, or it feels like a dream. And um, the art, um, because nature, if you look at nature, in order to survive, it creates the creativity. And we admire nature because it's so sophisticated. And in Burning Man, it's also in order to survive there, you create. And all of this piece of arts, oh my God, when you go out of Playa and bike there and look at the people's creativity, that's really great activity there and just blows your mind. It's, it just extends your consciousness. And of course, I go there to give a lot of concerts, sometimes more than 10. It's a, like a serving community, bringing indigenous awareness. And I always say indigenous, indigenous, but it's not doesn't stay only with ethnicity. Uh, it is also, I really like saying we're all indigenous to Mother Earth. Um, I like focusing on ancient ancestors, that everybody had a hunter ancestors. And they were all living off earth. They were all close to earth and following natural cycles. So bringing, awakening that memory in each of person and specifically in Burning Man when people's portals are really, really open. Uh, seeding that, it's important for me. That's why I go there. Yeah, so like that, the reason that you just told me that you go there, was that always consistent or it kind of transformed after you attended it? No, it was the first time in 2018 when I uh, all of a sudden got an invitation. First year when I moved to the United States, it was something big and something that I was like, whoa, I heard about Burning Man many times and here we are, we're going, <laughs> you know. And um, of course, I already went there with my, I, we were invited because of our music and I felt immediately, you know, just once after the first concert, okay, we, I need to continue coming back here. And this is where, first of all, I give, but I also receive a lot as an extension of my consciousness from human experience and human creativity. And um, Burning Man, it's also something that if you would like to create new society, like new community, it's like an experiment. You see uh, how you like, put, put a bunch of people there and then you see how they behave, you know, how they survive there. Like from the bird, birds flying high level, you can see that, oh, you know. And it was a renegade, uh, which was a non-official uh, burning man. No tickets, no organizing, no centered organizing. Uh, people went there just to keep tradition during lockdown. And what I surprised, uh, what was really surprising there, people somehow navigated themselves to create a camp and to keep the esplanade, the whole, you know, the pattern of, of the uh, settlements, and it was really non-chaotic and well naturally organized. Uh, yeah, it was it was really great. I really enjoyed the Renegade. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing. How can people best support you, and how can people best support the uh, Saka people? Uh, I'm building right now this app, as I mentioned, Olo app. It's um, an educational app where we highlight indigenous people, and also we give creative tools. So we're working on pilot version right now, the first version of it. And soon we're going to um, launch our crowdfunding campaign. So that will be the first support, the first step to support. Um, we're going to announce it on Instagram, nor even official. And um, the second is, you know, I believe that there is some common truth between all the beliefs. Um, Oloch ecosystem. So this app could be a great platform to create a uh, physical, you know, place where we can gather or even um, have those communities around the world, like a mycelium web, where our temple is tree, because you can see it under the tree. 
you know, uh, whatever you are, you are already walking in your temple. And um, there is something about um, this fundamental between all the um, confessions and religions. And I truly believe that um, every single person's experience is so unique and we should honor and respect them, it, respect it equally. And um, coming up with this of many beliefs, common truths, Allah ecosystem, for me, it's my life uh, long project. Um, and um, this is what I want to hand to future generation. And um, yeah, if you are like minded and, you know, when we start creating it officially, um, I hope that, you know, people can join us and co-create and co-build. Um, I believe in power of decentralization um, that happens after centralization. It's like a, almost like a jellyfish. In order to move, jellyfish goes this way and this way, this way and this way. So it's like spreads like decentralization and then whoop, centralization, decentralization, whoop, centralization. So it's a part of natural um, movement, like a cycle of life again, in order to follow the impermanence. And um, yeah, so now we're at the period where it's going like whoop, this way and we need to claim our uh, voices back. Yeah, beautiful. I, I hear what you're saying as inhale, exhale. Inhale is like centralizing into maybe your lungs. Exhale is like just expelling every, everywhere. Very good analogy, yeah. Any shout outs you'd like to mention? Um, yeah, I would like to, you know, say, um, usually um, finish my concerts or workshops with just one sentence. Um, don't be afraid to sound weird. <laughs> it's just uh, something that actually medicinal when we, you know, allow ourselves to uh, sound in every corner of our bodies and uh, without judgments towards ourselves or judging others that creates the judgments of the society towards someone who, who um, looks different or behaves different or talk different things. Um, I think um, when we are afraid of doing those things, then there's no evolution. Yeah, so that's why this is like a right time, right place uh, in the history of humanity to to sound weird. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, final closing thoughts for our listeners out there. What would you like to close with? Whether it's a final thought or a, a song you like to share, just whatever you want to close out with. A song. Reading it all.
Mannımızdı bu barın oran kaydırı. Barınların ördüge ağır ayılırım. Orta da ödüm etçilere. Algıstan, oran açılan, harıstan, rastan. Dom, dom, domini dom. Thank you so much. Can't believe you're here. Uh, I, this has been amazing. I hope you uh, come back again. And I uh, hope this podcast uh, serves, um, serves what it needs to do to uh, spread the message. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Wacht op.